but certainly we've got a couple of uh, quality case studies coming up. And this is to talk around our business to business cluster program. So this program uh, we've been running now since December and we've had uh, Oh, over 60, between 60 and 70 workplaces that have uh, participated in our cluster program. Uh, now, the topics have included leadership and culture, the ageing workforce, and also mental health. Uh, so we've had uh, facilitators that have uh, taken our workplaces through that program, and I've, I've participated in a lot of those and, and been present in a lot of those programs. And what I'm seeing is, as good as the facilitators are, and we've got uh, Doug, Doug Vordia from OzHelp, we have Jeff Pearman um, from Partners in Change doing the ageing workforce, and we also have John Fletcher from Leading Teams. So we've had three really, really good facilitators, but what I'm seeing there is the learning that takes place with each other. And, uh, and hopefully that happened on the Knowledge Cafe walk just then as well. But what we're seeing is uh, by organisations sharing their own experiences and sharing their own successes and their challenges, uh, we're seeing a, a really, really powerful learning journey happening uh, there uh, in our cluster program. So, um, but no doubt you'll, uh, you'll hear the workplaces talk about that, that for themselves. Uh, so the program consists of three half-day workshops uh, with some workplace-based activities in between um, and finalising or, you know, the end point is a, uh, is a strategy or an action plan for addressing that particular topic, whether it be mental health, uh, whether it be the ageing workforce. Uh, so, so really coming out of it with some clear objectives and outcomes. So, uh, so without further ado, I want to uh, introduce our first uh, case study. And, uh, and, and again, I, I guess it points back to you know, the topic of breakfast being about collaboration and innovation. And you know, in, in terms of, I guess, uh, WorkSafe and the work that we're doing collaboratively with uh, a Skills Tasmania and the Employer of Choice program, uh, we're trying to deliver these opportunities to workplaces because, you know, who are we? We're not the experts. Uh, you know, I guess we're brokering opportunities uh, for workplaces to get that advice and to share the learning with each other and at the end of the day, uh, improve uh, you know, their own workplaces and importantly, uh, their employees' health, wellbeing and safety. Uh, and ultimately engagement, and that's a key, key topic out of this morning as well. So moving on, uh, our first uh, speaker is uh, David Blaine, and uh, David's from RAC Tasmania, <coughs> and he's the safety and training manager where he has had the opportunity to work in several roles during the past 10 years, initially employed as a roadside patrolman he then made the adjustment to driving a desk. Driving a desk, okay, that's it, yeah. I'll, he'll t tell us more about that. Taking on the role of patrol coordinator and then progressing to his current position. Responsible for the safety, wellbeing and professional development of RACT patrols and the statewide contractor network. With this background, he brings a high level of practical experience and engagement to the RACT's people services team and has played an important role in promoting cultural change within the organisation over recent years. Sailing and travelling outback Australia with his better half allowed David to achieve a healthy work-life balance, navigating the challenges and exploring the possibilities facing the modern workplace. Welcome, David. Okay, dokie. Thanks, Cameron. Um, yeah, it's, uh, as uh, Cameron alluded to, uh, it's been a, a significant change uh, coming out of uh, a patrol van uh, wearing the, uh, the day glow. Uh, we used to call it the, the night in, uh, in shining armour, the, in the night in, in shining day glow, um, into the position that I hold now as a safety and training manager. Um, but I'm delighted to be here this morning, um, especially surrounded by so many people who are obviously um, involved in a way with their workplace and, 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 and are interested in their workers, in their health and wellbeing, uh, because that's certainly the direction that I wanted to take. Um, in my career. Um, I'm here to give you a bit of an insight into RACT's involvement in the Ageing Workforce Cluster Program, which is led by Jeff Pearman um, and, uh, from Partners in Change, and Cameron Blight from WorkSafe Tasmania over the past few months. This program really just complemented what we already do um, in our other health and wellbeing initiatives. Um, and so just to start off, we, we, we talked with Jeff, we sat down in a, in a workshop environment and got a really good insight into the challenges uh, that are facing most workplaces today uh, with an ageing population and workforce throughout Australia, and in particular Tasmania. And it sort of coincides with uh, 
and what we heard earlier um, from Stuart, uh, 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 this, this, this avalanche, this tsunami of, of, of problems that Tasmania have, it, it actually, I don't know, it makes you sound really, really, really scary uh, when you're trying to, you're faced with those challenges um, of people's poor health, but we're actually in a really good position um, in business and as employers to actually affect the people that we can affect, because they're the only people that we can affect uh, by trying to change their, their, uh, their uh, health and wellbeing. Um, the reality of the situation is that the, the, work, the, the, the workforce throughout Australia and Tasmania is ageing and ageing rapidly. It's, uh, the, the, the problem is that those pesky baby boomers uh, are quickly reaching retirement age and there just simply aren't enough younger workers to take over their positions. So it's really important that we as, we as a business uh, recognise that we have to try and engage our older workforce and keep them working for us, keep our skilled and experienced people working for us for longer uh, because we just simply can't replace, replace them with the same level of experience. Um, we need to change how we engage our older workforce so they can and importantly want to remain with us as employees. So the first part is that we went, underwent a, a business health check. After, after we, we got the facts and the figures about the doom and gloom of Tasmania and, uh, uh, but, uh, but some of the things that we, we really needed to know and understand so that we could actually pro progress and move forward, um, we went away and we underwent a, a health check of our own business. Um, so we had, to, we had to look at our policy and our procedure, but more importantly, our practice. You can have all the policy and the procedure in the world, but if you don't actually follow any of it, it's useless. Um, we actually think that we performed reasonably well um, in, the, in the business health check areas. In the, in the areas of health and wellbeing, workplace culture, workplace planning, productivity and engagement. However, what we did work out and the health check uh, that we followed uh, was we had a distinct deficiency in our knowledge continuity and transferring of skills as people leave the organisation. We had a couple of uh, examples, like really good examples of that um, a, a couple of years ago where uh, we had a person who was uh, uh, involved in payroll and they also looked after the, uh, the, the actual building maintenance. Um, we underwent a significant change at the RACT, where we literally doubled our staff overnight where we bought the destinations properties. Completely different culture. Uh, the payroll side of things doubled. Um, he was transitioning towards the end of his uh, working career, I guess, and, um, and made the decision to leave. One of the major failings, though, is that we never really actually sat down with him and actually worked out what he did. Um, and I, I don't think that we'd be the only people that uh, could be accused of that in organisations. So his job description probably said that he was the payroll. He looked after payroll and he looked after some building maintenance stuff. So here he, off, he heads off out the door and then all of a sudden there are people going, how do we get fobs to enter the building? Who's in charge of the fire maintenance teams and the HSRs and the building wardens and all those sorts of things? And unfortunately, his job description, probably from about 20, 25 years ago, didn't actually give a very clear picture as to what he actually did for us in the organisation. And we allowed him to walk out the door and not find out. And we're still recovering from that. Um, and, and another example, um, of was a lady uh, who left us not too long ago who was involved in um, um, a community engagement. She had a fantastic wealth of knowledge, had fantastic access to uh, people who, uh, uh, to, who were involved in the community and allowed the RACT to integrate with those people. Um, I, I could list thousands of the people, um, like yeah, uh, through poli police, community, council, all these people, and she made a decision very, very uh, just off her own back that she was going to leave, and so she left. But again, we didn't really capture what she knew and who she knew and how to get in contact with those people ourselves if we needed to. 
We also, so yeah, we realise that a lot of our important knowledge is not, is not documented. Um, the other problem that uh, the, our, the independent business health check uh, pointed out to us is that we actually have little understanding about the retirement intentions um, of our mature age workers. So we don't engage them in conversation. Well, they don't trust us to engage us in the conversations to tell us um, wh what their intentions are, whether they've got a plan, what their plan is. Is it in five years? Is it 10 years? We don't know. So our policies are well documented, but unfortunately not everyone knows about them. So we could have, or uh, well, we do have, uh, a flexible working arrangement uh, policies in place, but actually when you actually talk to our, our employees, they don't actually know what they are. Uh, so they have to go and actually seek that information out themselves. So we went back to the work, to the work group and we all discussed what we'd found. And interestingly enough, um, it was, it was, it was, there were a, all, a lot of the businesses actually had a lot of the same problems. So we were able to be very honest with each other about what we think we know and what we think we do, but then when the actual practices come down, we actually realise that we're actually not doing it necessarily that well. Some people are doing it much better than others. Um, I'm not trying to paint a rosy picture on the RACT though, obviously. <laughs> um, so then we had to go away and we had to actually do a specific age analysis on our business. So we had to choose, um, we chose to specifically interrogate the data for two of RACT's business units, which was club and travel. Um, and really it was because that, they were the easiest to do. I'm not, I'm not trying to be too lazy, but uh, the destinations property with a high itinerant workforce in and out, um, um, young, young, a, a lot of younger age demographic there. The actual club, um, which is, uh, so our roadside um, administration, uh, or uh, parts of the uh, driver training, parts of the business, that, that's what we actually looked at, and also travel, because uh, the, the other lady that was in the work group with me, Christine Bembao, um, had an interest in, in uh, RACT travel. But what we did know is that we could adopt the principles of the program to any of the other business units as we see fit. Um, I'm not going to excite you too much with all the data uh, that we collected and that we're able to extract from the payroll uh, system, um, but I've selected a few uh, to give you an idea at, at least about the process uh, that we went through to identify um, uh, the, the age analysis. So this graph here uh, just shows the highs in, resignation, uh, in, in resignations by age group. So we're trying to discern whether we're actually discriminated by age when we're actually employing people. And we're pretty comfortable from the data and by talking to people and looking at our processes and policies that we're actually not, a, we don't discriminate um, against age. So this is in 2015. Um, uh, the point is not going to work on the screen. Uh, but uh, yeah, the highs are in blue and the resignations are in red. So we had uh, 28 people uh, left us, which is indicated in red, and we hired 25. And as you can see, we were still hiring people up in the higher age brackets. Um, hired two in the 56 to 65 age bracket um, in, in 2015. Um, as you can see there as well, uh, the 26 to 25 um, age bracket um, significantly higher proportion of people hiring and leaving um, because they because <laughs> they're uh, the, the younger the younger generation they they, they want to uh, they're looking for a career they're looking for a path um, they get some experience with the RACT they leave they go somewhere else probably searching for money um, is is the normal practice with that age group of people um, and but when you get up into the older age brackets the six fifty six to sixty five they tend to stay with you so you see, if you employ people there, they stay with you to the end of their working career. Uh, the next slide is actually a, 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 a five-year trend. Sorry. This slide there is actually a, a five-year trend. And then um, over the five years, we had 108 staff leave us and 144 commence. A little concerning here is that uh, 26 uh, of the staff left us um, in the 56 plus category, which is a hell of a lot of experience walking out the door. Um, as I said, and this is in the last five years. 
And as I mentioned before, our knowledge and continuity and skills transfer is something that we need to do better. So having those 26 people walk out the door um, has left some big holes. We're also able to dispel some of the myths um, surrounding taking excessive um, sick leave uh, by older workers. And we found that the ratio of leave days taken by employees within the different age groups was similar at approximately 6.5 days per year, which initially I thought was quite high, but then working with the group in the cluster program, we actually worked out that that was pretty average and it was actually not too bad. Um, with the exception of the 15 to 25 year olds who actually had twice the ratio of 14 days off per year compared to all the other age groups. Um, the next phase of the cluster program looked at uh, interviewing at least five employees in the older age group of, of our workforce and getting their perspective on what they actually uh, need and want. This was highly enlightening, as the majority really opened up, uh, a little bit surprisingly, but they really did open up and they were quite honest and open um, in, with the answers to the questions. And actually, in some ways, they were quite brutal, brutally honest. Um, and this is where the, the cluster group became really effective, as when we came back to the group with our answers to the, to the questions, we combined our interview answers and we found that even amongst all, so many diverse businesses and even the diverse units of our business, that the answers followed very, very similar themes. So some of the things were that, 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 that there was a, a desire in the older workforce to keep challenging themselves mentally and personally, and that they got a real, they did actually still have a real satisfaction of achievement. That's what kept them going to work. Um, a requirement for flexibility of working arrangements as they age. So um, people will tend, what we found, what we generally know is that people will find a way to make it work for them. So the older demographic, um, they generally have a hell of a lot of sick leave um, that they've accumulated over a long period of time, and that if they want to work five, four days a week, they can. They just take a day off every Wednesday, and there's nothing you can do about it, because they come to you with a doctor's certificate, <laughs> and, 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 and that's just how they... So it's actually much better to have a conversation about why they need that time off, and actually come to a satisfactory arrangement from both parties, because uh, it's not all one-sided, as to what actually makes it work for you, as well as them. Um, they want to be included and listened to. They, have, um, they, they, they tend to feel that they get overlooked because they're older um, and that their experience is not recognised or valued. They recognise the value of good health because they know that when they reach retirement, they don't just want to go into the hole in the ground. They actually, they actually have decades now of life available to them. Um, and they like to be recognised for their loyalty and years of service. And again, I suppose, to be honest, the RACT hasn't done that very well either. Um, we used to. Um, we, uh, we still hand out the five-year, 10-year, 15, 20-year pins, but it used to be celebrated a lot, a lot more. Um, now, nowadays, you're lucky if you get a morning tea and someone pins a badge on you. Um, and a couple of people give a clap. So we actually, as part of the strategy and an action plan, we're actually wanting to look at improving uh, the, uh, the loyalty program that we have. Interestingly, and also concerningly, um, though, were the thoughts on what concerned them about retirement. And this was really, I found quite insightful for myself. So there was the obvious ones of having enough money, but it, to be honest, most of them had, that, that's the thing that's always been, you, you've been preparing for for your whole working life is retirement. So financially, most people were okay with where they were at. Um, a loss of purpose, so these are the, the things that, that were people really worried about going into retirement. A loss of purpose, a loss of friendship with work colleagues. Um, the effects on their relationship, especially with their partner, because they're going to be around all the time, or their partner might want to go off grey nomading and they couldn't think of anything worse, or they want to, their partner's just bought a sailing boat and wants to sail around the world, and, and, and the wife gets seasick. So 
they don't, they don't, they're not really actually looking forward to, 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 to retirement. And you'll probably find that they're going to hang around. And so you actually, instead of getting this, uh, 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 the, the problem of uh, absenteeism, you get the problem of presenteeism, which is actually a much bigger problem uh, that faces the working, uh, the, 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 the uh, employment em employers these days, sorry. Um, uh, the decision itself, Actually making the decision to retire, they really struggle with it. Um, and also the desire to be healthy enough to enjoy, enjoy their retirement. Um, and, and a big problem is they realise that, or they worry about being excluded once they have actually indicated that they are looking at retiring. So they might give you 12 months notice and then all of a sudden they stop being <coughs> getting sent on training courses. <coughs> Um, and yeah, so they, they stop, and they stop, stop seeing the benefits of, uh, 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 that are available to other people. Alarmingly, the majority of people interviewed admitted that they were not as prepared as they should be for retirement. Thanks, Mark. Um, <clears throat> um, and um, Jeff Pearman actually introduced us to the three P's, and they were the prepared, uh, the perplexed, and the procrastinators. And it actually follows work life. It actually follows your whole work and and and, and, and normal life. Uh, so only 20% of people are actually prepared for retirement, which is a startling statistic. 80% uh, are either perplexed. There's just too much information, and they don't know where to where to track it and how to make it work for them. Or they're procrastinators, where they actually just it's all too hard, so they're just not going to worry about it until it happens. Um, the other thing that we did was we conducted a survey on five, of, on five of our mature age workers and seeking their perspectives on consumer experiences and innovative ideas. With, um, we got, also got some feed, in pretty interesting feedback um, within the group. So they wanted simplified, customised services for older people. They wanted IT made easier. Digital, um, digital list, literacy uh, training. They say, don't, don't, they were really concerned that everyone just assumes that everyone wants everything digitally and that they've got access to the internet. Um, some of the statistics, I can't remember off the top of my head, but it's, it's a phenomenal number of people in the, age, uh, in the older age group that actually don't even have internet access. They don't want it. Uh, but they're increasingly being pushed down the IT line, um, even with their social security, um, their health, um, they also, uh, an interesting thing I suppose from an RACT point of view was that they wanted more autonomy um, uh, in vehicles, like self-parking. So a lot of that technology is becoming available, uh, but it's something that they really want to make driving easier for them so they continue driving in their old age. Uh, transport safety, uh, easily accessible Medicare, it's like uh, some of the, one of the ideas that they came up with, uh, dial a doctor or a Skype appointment. Um, and also choice in marketing materials. So don't ask, so don't assume what they want, actually ask them what they want. So they don't necessarily want, uh, one of the things from the RACT, we've got a Journeys magazine. I know there has been talk uh, that that was gonna go electronic. Um, and people don't, the older generation don't actually want it. They actually wanna hold something in their hands and read it. Uh, so it's something that we've re-evaluated re at the RACT and we're continuing the Journeys magazine. It's an expensive thing, so it's an easy cost-cutting measure, but it's not actually what people want, what our members want. So then we put everything, I know I'm going a bit over time because they're all standing up here looking at me. Um, uh, but then we put everything that we'd learned into um, a strategy and action plan. Now, to be honest, we're still working through that plan. Uh, we've got, we do have some really good ideas. Um, so we're working in conjunction with our people services team um, and, uh, and getting assistance by experienced coach Jeff Pearman who will actually come into our workplace um, and with a view to present our body of work uh, to the executive management team. That's still under, that's, that's still um, happening as we speak. But we believe that we can alleviate a lot of the fears that our employees have as they uh, near retirement age, as they transition into that retirement age. Uh, by engaging with them from a much earlier age. Uh, so we're talking about like from the age of about 50 and actually starting to have discussions with them then, actually giving them some of the information, facilitating uh, the, uh, some facilitating, um, the, the guidance for them uh, with some professionally facilitated stage of life workshops. 
um, investigating some alumni opportunities so that people know after they've left um, the workforce um, and, and still engage with the RACT, um, with people that they have worked with. Um, and we need to make sure, one of the really important things is, is that we need to make sure that our older workforce stay healthy so that they can enjoy their retirement. And that's one of my ultimate goals. Thanks very much.